Let us notice page 396, 396. We'll sing the first and the last verse. No, not one. 396. All who have it, let us sing. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. None else could heal all our soul diseases. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about us. Place your marks at page 904 for the Savior's invitation. Have you been to Jesus? Page 904 for the Savior's invitation. For our next election, let us notice page 988. 988. I'll be listening. 988. For those who can stand, please stand. When the Savior calls, I will answer. And when it calls for me, I will hear him. And when the Savior calls, I will answer. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Oh, I'll be somewhere listening, I'll be somewhere listening, I'll be somewhere listening for oh, my name. Oh, I'll be somewhere listening, I'll be somewhere listening, I'll be somewhere listening for oh, my name. If my heart is right when he calls me, and if my heart is right, I will hear him. And if my heart is right, Lord, when you call me, I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Oh, I'll be somewhere listening, I'll be somewhere, Lord, listening, I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Oh, I'll be somewhere, Lord, listening, I'll be somewhere 
listening up there somewhere, Lord, listening for my name. If my robe is white, Lord, when you call me, and if my robe is white, I will hear you. And if my robe is white, Lord, when you call me, I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Somewhere, Lord, a listener, I'll be somewhere, Lord, a listener, I'll be somewhere, Lord, a listener for my name. Oh, I'll be somewhere, Lord, a listener, I'll be somewhere, Lord, a listener, I'll be somewhere, Lord, a listener for my name. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening. I hope that everybody's going to be somewhere listening for your name. Isn't it going to be wonderful when the Lord comes and he comes and say, I'm coming for you or I'm coming for you. And you sitting there listening for your name. It'll be a terrible thing if you were alive that day and Lord Jesus came back and you was listening for your name and he never called you. It's like all of a sudden, wait a minute, reality hits. All that clubbing and partying and lying and thieving, all the things that we did, you mean, Lord Jesus, you weren't calling my name. That's going to be a haunting, haunting prospect for some people. We sing that song, but that song has words, and those words have meaning. Well, welcome everyone out to the East Palomar Street Church of Christ this morning. We thank you, and we're good to see everyone here. We have... VIPs in the house. I don't want to put them on the spot, but they know who they are. Uh, we love them dearly. Actually, everybody in the building is a VIP. And even if you're not in the building, if you're watching from afar, you're a VIP too. But I'm talking specifically about Brother Mike and Sister Joe Fosters. We love them dearly. We love them so much. Good to see them. And I know it took a minute to get down here from where they live. So you guys make sure that you see the Fosters on your way out. They are a brethren. They are, we love them so much, and we miss seeing them, and it's good to see them on uh, this morning. I want to jump right into the lesson. I don't want to waste a lot of time. Amen, somebody. I want, we, we are coming off of a five-part series. Actually, we're coming off of six lessons in Acts chapter number 20. But the last five were dealing with Paul's farewell message to the Ephesian elders, and they were... Uh, they had come to Miletus, and they were sitting, and we use the analogy of a coffee shop, and, and Paul gave this very heartfelt and very emotional message, and we have so many uh, lessons and precepts that we glean out of that. But before we just take off and jump into Acts 21 and go back to Caesarea and Rome and all the other things that the Apostle Paul is going to deal with, and we're going to be following through because we're trying to go through this whole series of verse by verse. But I wanted to, before we did that, go back, go back with the Ephesian elders. As you recall, they accompanied Paul to the ship. They were praying. They were, there was so much emotion. And Paul said, I know you're not going to see my face anymore because he was facing a unique persecution for preaching the good news of the gospel, for preaching about Jesus Christ. So he was facing some obstacles that some of us haven't faced, maybe some of us have. There's certainly parts of the world right now where we have saints that are 
that are facing similar obstacles uh, to that of the Apostle Paul. But I like to, as we did with the woman that had an issue of blood, as we did when we preached the sermon on Save the Centurion, the centurion soldier that was at the base of the cross when Christ Jesus, uh, when, when, when he had that full, that full episode about you know, the death and the burial and then the resurrection. Sometimes I like to follow and see what happened to the woman that had an issue of blood. Yeah. What happened to the centurion? What happened to the eunuch after he ran into Philip and he went on his way rejoicing? And we believe that, you know, he may have returned to uh, Ethiopia. So for, before we go on, I would like to follow these elders. And if you can imagine in your mind, they're at the dock and the Apostle Paul's ship takes off and they're waving and they're kind of tearing up still and they begin to either walk or ride or whatever mode of transportation they had, they had to go back to Ephesus. So the title of this lesson is going to simply be Back to the Future or Stay Woke Part 2. Because back to the future means that they have to go back to the city that was riotous. It was a cesspool of worship of Artemis or Diana. They had this riot in the Colosseum. This is the environment that these elders are going back to without their leader. The Apostle Paul had spent three years in Ephesus. It's the longest of any stay of the Apostle Paul in any one location in the entire scripture. So now, these brethren, having received this message, having received this charge, have to go back by themselves. And I don't know about you, but all of us at some day have to learn to walk without mommy and daddy. I remember when my father taught me how to ride a bicycle, and I had always, Brother Dave, rode with training wheels. And they was not always straight. Sometimes I could lean and keep pedaling, but I always had training wheels, so I never fell. And then one day, my father, in the driveway, took the training wheels off. And he set me on the bike, and we started riding down the street, and he was holding on, Brother Whitley. He said, son, I got you. Son, I got you. Son, I got you. Just keep pedaling. I got you. And I look back, and he's there, and I look back, and he was there, and I look back, and he was there. And then one time, I look back, Brother Tony, and he wasn't there. And I'm going down the street with no training wheels. And that's how I learned how to ride a bicycle. We have these men that are now having to learn how to ride a bicycle without the Apostle Paul. And so what I would like to do for this lesson is going to be several concepts that we're going to look at, but I chose two scriptures for this one because I think it speaks to where we want to go. The first one is going to be in uh, 2 Timothy chapter number 1. The verse is number 13. And then the second one is going to go back and we're going to look at Paul's Bible, the version at least that he had at the time that these brethren are now uh, uh, learning how to ride a bike, so to speak. We know that he's written so, several letters. We'll go into that the next time we pick up Acts chapter number 21. But those were not in wide circulation. What they had was the Tanakh, or the Old Testament scriptures. So the first one I'd like to go to is in his second letter to Timothy. And the passage there uh, simply reads, Hold fast the form of sound words or doctrine, which thou hast heard of me, in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. 
that good thing which was committed unto thee, keep, keep, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. The second one is going to go back to the book of Exodus. The chapter is number 29. Here this has to do with the consecration of Aaron and his sons. So on this one, the text simply reads, And thou shalt burn the whole ram upon the altar. It is a burnt offering unto the Lord, it is a sweet savor, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And thou shalt take the other ram, and Aaron and his son shall put their hands upon the head of the ram. Then thou shalt kill the ram and take of his blood and put it upon the tip of the right ear of Aaron and upon the tip of the right ear of his sons and upon the thumb of their right hand and upon the great toe of their right foot and sprinkle the blood upon the altar round about. And thou shalt take, let me get, let me get, let me get right with you, brothers. Verse 21, and thou shalt take of the blood that is upon the altar and of the anointing oil and sprinkle it upon Aaron and upon his garments and upon his sons and upon the garments of his sons with him. And he shall be hallowed and his garments and his sons and his son's garments with him. We're looking at the consecration of these elders. We're looking at the consecration of Aaron and his sons. If we go back where we want to really draw the main point of the lesson, it's going to be in Exodus. I want to look at verse 18 first, and he says, And thou shalt burn the whole ram upon the altar. It is a burnt offering unto the Lord. If you go into the book of Leviticus, it talks about five offerings. There are sweet savor offerings, and then there are offerings that we would consider to be sacrifices. We won't go into that today on this lesson. But the burnt offering was a whole or complete offering. It's where you took the entire animal and you put the animal on the altar and you burn the hoof, the hair, the skull, the head, everything. It was a complete offering, in other words. So this offering that they are now uh, performing, there are portions that they need to keep, and that's primarily the blood. And God tells Moses to tell or, or to instruct them on how he wants the blood to be applied to Aaron and his sons. And the application of this blood symbology simply means how the priests themselves need to be clean or sanctified before they could render services unto God. Sometimes, brethren, we have to look at ourselves, examine ourselves, look at our lives, look at what we're doing, how, what our speech is like, so that we can go back to our Ephesus and help lead a home, a family, a job, a marriage, whatever the case might be, sometimes we have to look at ourselves first. And I'm talking about me too. Amen. We have to look at ourselves first and not be so quick to look at someone else. All right. This sprinkling of the ram's blood indicates their sanctification. And that word simply means being set apart. It would be as if you grow up in your family and you have a circle of friends or you grow up and you have your children, but God looks upon you 
and he sees something different. He sees something special. He says, you are set apart for me. You are set apart for the work that I have unto you to do. So first thing is you need to recognize who you are, and then you need to recognize whose you are, who you belong to. So this setting apart was very important. If we go in and begin to look at it, we see in 1 Peter chapter number 1, verse 15, it says, but as he which is but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Hebrews 12, 14, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. We find in 2 Timothy chapter number 1, verse number 9, I'll look at verse number 8 first. Be not therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. According to the power of God, who have saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purposes and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. So the first thing, brethren, we have to understand what we see in the, in the Exodus account and what we see even in the Ephesian elders is that these men cannot go back and help formulate the house of God if they have not gotten their own lives right. I think this is important for us because we tend to look beyond ourselves and, again, focus on everybody else's fault and what's going on in everybody else's life. So the first thing we have to do is recognize that we have a charge, just as they did, that we must be holy, just as God is holy. Then the second one, it says, then shalt thou kill the ram and take his blood and put it on the right ear of Aaron. Why the right ear of Aaron? Whether you are right-handed or left-handed, I don't believe is significant in this text. But if you go through the Bible, uh, clearly they did have some belief that if you were a left-handed man, you were, you were a little bit different. Something was just a little bit different about you. Not that it was bad all the time, but the right hand is typically uh, symbolic of a right standing or a right walking. So we just want to take this from symbolic terms and not uh, disparage or look at somebody based on their right-handed or left-handed. That's what the Sadducees and Pharisees did. We're, We're not doing that. But in the context of this lesson, it's important to understand Why in each case it said right hand, right thumb, right ear? Because in these times in biblical language or literature, that just simply meant the correct hand or the correct foot. So he says, thou shalt kill the ram and take his blood and put it on the right ear of Aaron. And what I like about this is even though it's talking about Aaron and his sons and the entire priesthood, God had Moses start with Aaron. He didn't start with the sons yet. He said, I want you to put this on Aaron's ear because Aaron, to me, is the one that's going to lead the priesthood. And the reason why it's on Aaron's ear is because Aaron has to be in tune and listen to me, God. His sons, based on the patriarchal system, are going to listen to Aaron. But I want Aaron to listen and focus on me. So we see this this precept, this second precept, how it symbolizes a sensitivity to God. Jeremiah chapter number 32, verse number 27, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Psalms 145, verse number 3, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. So Aaron, in all your travels, in all the problems, and all the issues that you're going to have with this congregation in the wilderness, 
Same with you, Ephesian elders. When you get back to Ephesus and all the problems and all the issues that you're going to have trying to guide this congregation in this rough city, the first thing you need to do is recognize and pay attention to God. Make sure that your heart is clean. Make sure that your vision is 2020. Make sure that your speech is loving. Make sure that your conduct is worthy of the vocation in which you are called. These are the things that were tasked to Aaron and his sons, but then we see emblematic in what the elders were supposed to do for the saints in Ephesus. And we say elders, brethren, but this is really indicative of all of us. All of us should have these same characteristics. The next one, it says, and upon the right ear of his sons. You see, God is methodical. When we, when we slow down, and we, we normally just read these texts and we just blow by them. But if we slow down, we can see God's blueprint. We can see God's program. We can see God's plan. The first thing was to cleanse yourselves. The second thing was, Mr. Aaron, you need to pay attention. You paying attention to me. The third thing is, now I want that same sanctifying blood. I want it on the ear of Aaron's sons. Because the sons are going to pay in a patriarchal system. They're going to pay attention to the father. They're going to get their teaching and understanding and, 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 and the word of God and the will of God. They're going to get that from Aaron, but they need to be attentive too. Because they can turn, about, turn around and become prodigals. They can turn around and become like Eli's sons. So what he's saying here in the second precept is, I'm sorry, the third precept is upon the ears of the right ear of his sons. This simple, simply symbolizes a, a sensitivity to the word of God. Again, they being, coming, they being ones that are coming up in the patriarchal system. The same thing would apply to the Ephesian elders or to all of us is that we must be attentive to the word of God. And I, I just want to say this right now. This is, this is, this is not a rah-rah sermon. This is a reflection sermon. We're looking back. We're trying to follow these Ephesian elders after they went through this experience with Paul. And, and now they're going back to Ephesus and they're going to have some problems, y'all. They've got some issues they have to deal with. We fall in the same category. So Aaron's sons had this blood put on their right ear. And we see in Psalms 119, 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. In Luke chapter number 11, verse number 28, but he said, yea, rather blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Psalms chapter number 18, division 18, verse number 30. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. Matthew chapter number 24, the verses number 35. He, uh, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Amen. So the sanctifying of the ears. First to Aaron. And now to his sons means that as the patriarchs or as the leadership or as those that are going to be working with the congregation. And I know the, the difference between the we know the difference between the Old Testament construct and the New Testament construct. But the point of it is, is that our ears have to be sanctified so that we can hear the word of God. The next one, brethren. And upon their right hand. So they got blood on the ear now. And they got blood on the right hand. Now, if you and I were sitting back in those days of Exodus, we might look at this and say, this is some weird stuff. You got blood of animals. And, 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 and you're touching ears. And, 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 and you, now you're, you're touching the thumb of the right hand. 
But Williams, why the thumb? Why not the index finger? Because the thumb symbolically is the finger that closes the hand, that closes, that makes the fist, that holds everything together. So the thumb in Hebraic culture was indicative of the leading aspect of your work. The whole concept of it being the hand speaks to your work with God. Whether that work is foul or whether that work is righteous. And when you go through the sacrifices and you begin to understand there was a sacrifice of service. And so God is saying, from now on, whenever you guys work for me, whether you're setting stuff up, breaking it down, we're traveling in the wilderness, you're, you're preaching, you're praying, you're, you're doing studies, any work you do for me must be sanctified. And as a reminder, I want to put this blood on your thumb because that symbolizes the work that you're going to do for me. So these Ephesian elders, when they go back to Ephesus, they can't be crossing the folk up. They can't be murmuring. They can't be involved in all of the entrapments, entanglements. They have to stay right with God because they have a work to do. They have a job to do. And by application and extension, it, ex it, it applies to all of us. How would we look if we deal with one another crookedly? And we turn around and say, that's okay. That's not on me. Let the elder deal with that. Let the minister deal with that. This sanctification, although we're looking at it symbolically through the blood of the Old Testament, it was replaced by the blood of Christ Jesus. That means that everything that was applicable to them is even more so applicable to us because now we have the pure blood, the pure blood of the Lamb. So this concept of having this blood on their, on their hands, on their thumb, I'm sorry, is so important for us. This fourth concept, I believe the, I hope I'm all on par with the slide, but the fourth uh, uh, concept, that's the only problem about uh, this technology. It symbolizes of the work of the ministry. Let's, let's move on now to the fifth one. And the fifth one is upon the great toe of the right foot. Now, I got a dab of blood, Brother Dave, on my ear. I got a dab of blood, Brother Dash, on my thumb. And now I got a dab of blood on my great toe of my, white, my right foot. The same concept applies that if you lose your big toe, it affects your balance, it affects your navigation. When I was teaching kids how to pitch and I wanted to, them to throw a strike or to throw the ball from the outfield all the way to the home plate, we had a bucket drill. We would lay the bucket down on, on, on on the, on, at home plate, and they had to learn to try to hit the bucket from the outfield. They said, well, coach, how I do it? I said, point your big toe. That lead foot, if you point your big toe, the rest of your body's going to follow it. That's how you learn to throw straight. So you have now this blood on the big toe of the right foot. This symbolizes the walk with God. It symbolizes your life and how you going about, never mind the work, never mind the hearing, but your walk with him over time. As you, as you go through life and you begin to experience things and setbacks and problems and troubles, are you going to allow the problems of life to get you down all the time? Are you going to allow the, the, the issues that you're facing that might be localized issues, are you going to allow them to take away from your praise from God? Are you going to allow the issues that you're dealing with in your life to separate you from your loved ones? 
Are you going to allow the issues of your life to, to make you begin to doubt the promises of God? Amen. It's talking about your walk with God. So that's why he says, look, I want to sanctify the big toe of your right foot. We see this concept in Proverbs chapter number 25, verse number 17. Withdraw thy foot from the neighbor's house, lest he be weary of thee, and so hate thee. Hebrews 12, 13. And make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. But uh, let it rather be healed and follow peace with all men without, without uh, which no man shall see the Lord. And one of my favorites, Ecclesiastes chapter number five, the verse number one, it says, set thy foot when thou goest into the house of the Lord and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools. For they consider not that they do evil. Be not rash with thy mouth. And let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven and thou upon the earth. Therefore, let thy words be few. In other words, the walk that we have with God was so important that in this, you could call it a ritual, but in this procession of anointing or sanctifying the priest, these are the ones that are going to work for God. God said, I have some symbolic things that I want them to go through. They may not even understand all of this stuff, but I want them to go through it so that when they reflect and they pray later on, it's going to start to click. It's going to start to mean something to them because I am asking or, or demanding, literally, if you are God, that they be holy, that they be separate, that they be sanctified, that they be set apart, that they are not like the rest of the world. And to remind them, I'm going to have them go through this process. This is the same concept that the Apostle Paul has just gone through with the Ephesian elders. So then we go and look at the next concept. At the next concept, brother, we see it says, and sprinkle the blood upon the altar and round about. This symbolizes our awareness of our surroundings. Because they're already listening to the word of God. They already have blood on the ear. They already have blood on the toe. But now God is saying, go to the altar. And sprinkle blood around the altar. This is symbolic of an understanding that you are in the presence of God. Amen. Now, in their Old Testament times, God came down in the spirit and rested on the mercy seat with the ark. Now we know that he dwells among us and with us. But the concept here is to remind them that they are constantly in the presence of God. And for us, we just need to go over to Ephesians chapter number four and look at verse number 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints your Bible might say equipping, Ephesians chapter number 4, verse number 12, for the perfecting or equipping of the saints for the working of the ministry. Once again, we cannot come to God and be crooked and then expect to turn around and help people. We have to get our own hearts right, our own hearts together. But this is important, it was important for them, and it is important for us. But I really wanted to go over to the last passage here. Verse 21. It says, And thou shalt take the blood that is upon the altar, and the anointing oil, and sprinkle it on Aaron. Aaron already got blood on him. Sprinkle it on Aaron. 
I want it on his clothes. I want it on his sons. I want it on his son's garments because it shall be hallowed and his garments and his sons and his son's garments with him. In other words, God is now saying, I want you to take this blood, this blood of the sacrifice, this blood that is indicating sanctification, this blood that is indicates being set apart. And now I want you to just sprinkle it all over them. Never mind the ear and the foot and the thumb. I want their clothes. I want their sandals. I want their hair. I want the robe. I want everything that they are wearing covered in the blood. In other words, God is saying something. He says, when you are working for me, your whole life, your whole attitude, your whole thought, the way you conduct yourself, the way you live, the way you walk, the way you treat people, everything about you should be holy. God is expressing his desire for the priesthood, but brethren, we know that we are a royal priesthood. We now are, have replaced this priesthood. So God is giving them instructions by examples on how they should live their life. And on this precept, it simply speaks to the sensitivity of their status. Sometimes we don't recognize that we are a child of God. I mean, we might know it. We might think it. We, we understand it. We, we're not saying that we're pagans or we walk away or we don't give God his honor. We're not saying that. What this lesson is designed to do is to remind us of the importance of these concepts, not in Brother William's eye, not in Brother Whitley's eye, not in Brother Keith's eye, but in the eyesight of God. God was so serious that he slowed the whole process down. And he said, there's some things that you guys need to know about your character. And so he taught them. And so we take this, brother, into Romans chapter number 12. Romans chapter number 12, you know, we, we talked about it. We've preached through the book of Romans. And we always kind of went to Romans 12. Because Romans 12 is really the application piece. You know Romans, not to get into it, but it's about your justification and about your sanctification, about your glorification. But Romans chapter 12, every single verse is about how you live your life based on everything that you read in the previous 11 chapters. So when you get to Romans 12, it's all about conduct. He starts off in 1 and 2, talk about the mercies of God. But I want to pick, up, pick it up in verse 3. He says, For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. And we, we tried to stop there. I don't want to preach another sermon, but he's talking about the measure of faith. In other words, Brother Duncan might have more faith than me in certain areas. Brother Vega may have more faith than me in certain areas. Brother Jimmy may have more faith than me in certain areas. Brother Tony, the sisters as well. He's talking about the measure of your faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many uh, uh, are one body in Christ, and every one members of one another. Having then gifts differing, differing according to the grace that is given to us, whereby prophesy. Let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. There it is again. I have one brother just... just kind of was getting on somebody else and just said, well, go do this and tell them this and tell them that. And this, this, this brother, I, I, I kind of pulled him aside. I said, wait a minute, brother, you, you've been in sales all your life. You, you're used to talking to people. You're used to not confronting, but you're used to going out and being, uh, uh, you know, 
just running up in people's face, so to speak. I said, but that's not everybody's faith. and Everybody's not there where you at. Some people will be better off just having a private one-on-one conversation over a lunch or just meeting them out in the parking lot. Not everyone is that same way. They don't have the same measure of faith in that particular item. Verse 7. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministry, or he that teacheth on teaching. Sometimes you get some people that want to minister so bad or preach so bad. Not everybody is a preacher. Not everybody is a song leader. If I try to lead songs, the the animals will start howling. So I stay in my lane. Amen. (laughs) But God gave these gifts and these things to people so that they can use them. And the point is that when God has given you a gift, don't take your gift and hide it up under the bench. If God has given you something, then use it. And we have to be humble enough to allow people to have that room. Verse 8. Or he that extorteth on extortion, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. Everybody in here is not Big Bank Hank. A lot of folk live check to check. But if you got it like that, don't brag about it. Go on and use your gift to serve the Lord. He that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without dissemination. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is in good. Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. Not slothful in our business. Lord, have mercy. Not slothful in business. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of the saints, given over to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one towards another. Mind not high things, but uh, condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Do you hear all these concepts? It's literally like the application piece of what we read in Exodus. Verse 18, if it is possible, as much as live in you, live peaceable with all men. Verse 19, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thy enemy is hungry, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink, for in doing so thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. We wanted to, brethren, before we just pass on and and head by this lesson of Acts chapter number 20. We want to just look at some of the things that might be on these elders' minds as they go back and try to serve God and how they try to do their best with their own flaws, because Paul even told them, even some of you, you know, grievous wolves may come up among you. And we know about some of the warnings that he told them about or not them per se, but told us. First Timothy chapter number one, verse number six. You talk about some having swerved from the faith. Y'all know swerve. That's, that's kind of an ebonics term when you kind of swerve around an obstacle in the road. But he told them, he said, now, uh, verse five, now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and a good conscience and of faith unfeigned, from which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain, vain jangling. Some folk in the church are going to swerve by those things. Amen. And so they have to be ready for that. And some are going to be shipwrecked in the face. First Timothy chapter number 1, verse number 18. 
This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou be them mightest war a good warfare, that thou might be uh, them that might of war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away, put away the good conscience concerning the faith and have made shipwreck. This is looking at us. This is turning the mirror on us and say, wait a minute, brother Williams, I, I didn't come here to get beat up this morning. No, brother. This is not to beat us up. And I myself am in this text. What it's meant to do is put us in remembrance of God and who we are, whose we are, and the things that we ought to do in order to please him. Even talking in 1 Timothy chapter number 4, verse number 1, there will be some that clearly depart from the faith. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times shall shun depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So brethren, we have to have our hearts right. We have to have our ears tabbed with blood. We have to have our thumbs in the working of the ministry tabbed with blood. We have to have that big toe so that we walk with God tabbed with blood. And then we have to have the altar, which is where we put our sacrifice tabbed with blood. And then we have to have our whole body, just everything about us, our clothes, our garments, everything tapped with the blood, but the, not the blood of animals, but the blood of Christ Jesus. Because this is when we will humble ourselves and if there comes a time where we need to apologize, we have no problem apologizing. Amen. If there comes a time where we need to humble ourselves, we will have no problem humbling ourselves. If there's a time where we need to watch our tongues, there's, we won't have any problem watching our tongues because of what Christ Jesus did. Remember, brethren, the cross is always the why. Everything in the Old Testament points towards the cross. Everything in the New Testament points back to the cross. So if you are here today, brethren, and you have not given your life unto Christ Jesus, you come by hearing that gospel message. You come by believing the same. You come by repenting of your sins. You come by confessing the only name given in heaven or among men, whereby we may be saved. And you come by being baptized in water for the remission of your sins. And there we remain faithful unto death. If I had to put a thesis on this, this lesson, despite us trying to do this tech, technology stuff, it would simply be to stay woke. It would simply be to stay woke and make sure that we keep our hearts pure and unspotted from the world. Brother Tony has a closing song, and the brothers have the prayer request. God bless you so much. Have you
First of all, I want to thank Brother Daryl for delivering that great message uh, this morning. Um, pray that the things that were said and heard would be able to edify, edify us. So we may go out and teach others uh, another portion that says the word. Um, I do not have any visitors' cards. However, I do have one prayer request card. It's coming from Daryl. Uh, and it says, uh, pray for his grandson, Krishano. And Shay for a speedy recovery, plus uh, him, his family, and himself. So let's continue to pray for Gerald and all the other individuals that was uh, mentioned in the beginning of uh, worship this morning. I do, I do not have any other uh, prayer request cards, but we do have one standing. Um, I'd like to uh, ask for prayers for my, me and my family. Um, also pray for my grandma and my aunt. Um, they're still like recovering with um, their illnesses and stuff. Um, I'd also like to pray for my aunt's daughter, Shani. Uh, she's in the ICU right now, and they don't really know what's wrong with her. So we're just hoping that she comes out okay. Okay. Um, like I said, I don't have any other prayer request cards, so. So let's uh, start, stand for a closing verse and prayer. Let's pray. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah, from the heavens praise His name, praise Jehovah in the highest, all His angels praise from praise, all His souls together praise Him, the moon and stars on high, praise Jehovah in heaven's God. pray. Heavenly Father, once again, dear Lord, we come to you as humble as we know how, dear Lord. Dear Lord, so thank you, for dear Lord, for allowing us to wake up and see another beautiful day, dear Lord. Allowing us to come out and worship you in spirit and in truth, dear Lord. Dear Lord, we pray for those who ask for, for the well-being of their families, dear Lord, and those who are sick and afflicted, dear Lord, especially those in the household of faith. Dear Lord, not just only those who stood up and those who uh, filled out prayer cards, but those who do not know you, dear Lord, and but they're going through trial and tribulations. We come on their behalf, dear Lord, asking you to be with them also. And dear Lord, we pray, dear Lord, that the that the uh, the songs that were sung today, the, the communion that was performed, the the monies that was given in the collections, uh, the the message that was given, and the prayers that was lifted up, dear Lord, we pray that all these acts of the services, dear Lord, is pleasing and acceptance, acceptable to your side, dear Lord. And as we get ready to lead this building, dear Lord, we ask that you. Uh, deliver each one of us to our many places aboard, dear Lord. Until we meet again, we ask to spare your son, in Jesus' name. Amen.